Hello everyone and welcome to HIV Scotland live Q&A and we're delighted that today we have Professor Jason Leach who is the National Clinical Director for the Scottish Government. But before we meet Jason, I'm delighted to introduce to you my co-presenter, Dr Nicoletta Polacek, who's the Chair of HIV Scotland's Board. Say hi Nicoletta. Hi everyone. So we're going to uh, get, be joined by Professor Jason Leach now. Um, and then we, Nicolette and I are going to take through some questions that have already been submitted. But if you do have any more questions throughout the course of the live stream, then please do just pop them in the comments and we will try and get to them as best we can. Hi, Jason. How are you? I'm very well. How are you all? Nice to see you. Not too bad, thanks. And thanks for taking the time to come and speak to us about HIV and how it interacts with uh, the current pandemic that we're, we're, we're facing. I'm happy, I'm happy to do so. I may not have every answer, but I'll I'll certainly do my best for you. And I'll tell you if I don't have the answer. So we've, we've got a, a sort of easy, well, I think it's an easy opener for you, um, but it was a question that was submitted more generally about coronavirus and testing and specific um, specific. I just lost so, your sound. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Hello. So I'll put the question up there. Why can't we speed up testing given some people have tested positive without having symptoms? Oh, there we go. You're back. You're back. Right. Uh, so I think it was about, is it the question that's along the bottom of the screen? Is it testing? Yes, that's the question on testing that we've got first up. Yeah, so t testing is a, a really complex piece of the puzzle. The, the first thing sounds a little defensive, and then I promise I'll, I'll, I'll answer the testing question more thoroughly. The, f the first thing is I think, I think we've, misunderstood its role a little, partly because it's become this iconic solution. It, it is, of course, part of the solution. It, you don't need to tell the HIV community how important a, a test for a disease is, but, but it is what you do with that test at the right time and then what you do with the test on an ongoing basis that, that matters. And this virus is four months old. I mean, it, I, I can't, I, I can barely understand the science of viruses we've had for 10 years. This, this actual virus is four months old. So the testing has been really challenging, but the science has managed to get as a PCR test really quite quickly. So we now have a test that tells you within a certain window of opportunity, when you have the virus in your droplets, that's all it can do. It finds virus in your saliva, basically. And it can't even really yet do much about volume or really detailed, it can't do genetics of did I give it to you or did you give it to me? It's virus, yes or no. That's the level the test is presently at. And that's really helpful if you've got people with disease, with active symptoms. It's not quite so helpful with pre-symptomatic people, but it helps a little, just a little. And it, it it's of almost no use at all for screening. It, it, it finds some asymptomatic people, but almost, almost none. So this, this very informed community know the difference between antigen testing and antibody testing, meaning the immune, immunological response, and that response is what we're after, and that, that will only become possible in the next little while. You can buy an, an antibody test on Amazon. It finds the antibodies in about 15% of the cases, so don't waste your money. But one is coming in the next few weeks and months that we will be able to use. So we've expanded testing quite dramatically in the last three, four weeks. We now do all key workers. We're going to do all over 70 hospital admissions. We're going to do every care home admission. And then gradually, and the most exciting thing I think is on the way out, we'll have to do much more testing and tracking. That, that will be where testing will go next. Thank you. And uh, Nicoletta is going to ask the second question. Yes, I have a question here from a woman uh, in her late 50s. Um, she works in residential care um, and she's been working in residential care for a number of years. Uh, she has uh, COPD and otherwise has good health. She says she's part of the sheltered group. And uh, the question is about, uh, would I be able to return to work if the appropriate PPE is in place prior to the 12 weeks isolation period? Uh, it so, so that, that's a kind of fairly odd story. So let, let's deal with the, the shielded group and presume she's in it. From that history, she wouldn't be shielded. But there may be other, there may be other things going on. Shielding is very specific. It's 160,000 people 
We haven't done it lightly. Shielding, shielding is hard. The, the letter that we had to write to the shielded group, I, I didn't write, I didn't like writing it. It basically said, cut yourself off from the world for 12 weeks. I mean, it, it wasn't a pleasant thing to tell people to do. I've got some friends in the shielded group who have had solid organ transplants, some bone marrow transplant people. It's tough. It's really tough. So you don't want to be in the shielded group if you can avoid it. But of course you want to be in it if it's the right place to be and to protect yourself. The shielded group initial letter says 12 weeks. We will tell the shielded group what happens after the 12 weeks. And that will depend a lot on where we are in the curve of the virus and our ability to protect that group on the way out. But for now, anybody in the actual shielded group, important not to confuse it with the next group down, which is the group of pregnant women over 70s and those who get the flu vaccine for health reasons who aren't shielded. They are taking social isolation very seriously, but they are not shielded. That group, the, the, there is a possibility of them going to work. The shielded group, definitely not. So the next question we've got is one for after uh, we've dealt with this pandemic, which is is nice to think about what, when this is all over. I, I, um, I wish it, I wish it would come. <laughs> Do you think um, a public health campaign for something like HIV should um, should be either the responsibility of the Scottish government or the third sector or a partnership of both? to do something similar that we've done with coronavirus over these past four months? It's, a, it's an interesting question. My, my instinct is always not, not being a content expert in your particular area, although I have actually used the HIV epidemic in the 90s as an example a little in, in, in this work because I was there. I was a surgeon. I was a dentist and then an oral surgeon during the late 90s, a trainee surgeon, a lot younger than I look now, let me tell you. And I, I lived through the both the stigma, the unknown, because we didn't know what we were dealing with, in inverted commas, and, and all of the PPE challenges then that a smaller community understood, transmission challenges about what 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 HIV was and what, what the virus did and what it didn't do and how we managed all that. So actually, I've gone back in my mind to some of those really, really challenging conversations I had with patients and families when, when, we, didn't, when we didn't really know what, what we were dealing with. And I think HIV gives us some really good examples of both research and treatment, but also how you try and change the public's view of a disease or a condition. And I think there are things to learn. So my instinct would always be to do that jointly with organizations who understand the content best, ne never, never to try and do that with a set of people who don't understand it. The funding of that, of course, is a, is a question perhaps slightly above my pay grade, but it, it doesn't seem like a like a bad idea to do that together like we've done for sepsis or like we do for diabetic foot exam whatever the whatever the thing might be we're trying to teach the population about that will be about teaching the hiv community also i think about teaching the population what it is now in 2020 to be hiv positive what is what does that mean and why is that different from 1995 yeah absolutely nicoletta yeah i'm kind of Speaking up on the HIV community, I have a question here about um, um, whether there's evidence, uh, be it since the interception and or during the COVID-19 pandemic, that antiretroviral, antiretroviral use for the suppression of HIV has resulted in that cohort population, either being uh, at lesser risk of contacting COVID at all, or being a lesser risk of contracting the full effect of COVID-19, for example, minor symptoms as the antiretrovirals provide some sort of protection? So because I knew I was coming uh, and, and your community were, would I, I, I could guess and, and talk about some of the chat. I, I knew this would, I knew this would come up and I didn't know the answer. So I went and had some of my guys look and the, the pretty predictable answer is no. We, we as yet don't, don't have any evidence that it makes it worse or better, or makes it makes it in any way different. There is there are huge research projects you can imagine. We now have over two million people with this infection around the world. Some who have survived, some who very unfortunately have died. Scotland is in amongst those research programs, and many of them are about antiviral treatment in the round. You'll have seen some news just recently, probably that one of those first trials has been stopped 
because it not only was it not working, we think it was probably harming individuals. So a familiar story to clinical researchers, but a difficult story for such a prominent disease in the whole world, where, where we're, we're basically doing that research in the public eye and we're learning as we go. I, I get into trouble. I go on the radio and they play back a clip from a month ago and wonder why I'm now saying something different. But I'm saying something different because I know more than I knew a month ago. It's quite hard to, to, to do that. But unless you only go on the TV once, you, you're going to have to. We're going to have to keep doing that. So, the, presently, I'm a, I'm afraid no evidence. But but there are researchers looking into it. Thank you. Okay, so the next question we've got is around unintended pregnancy and what advice you might give people um, to avoid unintended pregnancy without worrying people. Um, so we had an example um, from NHS Lanarkshire who are continuing to. Uh, send out the pill and condoms by post uh, because they want everyone to stay healthy. Um, and then a, a side question was, is the virus submitted, uh, transmitted through semen? We, we don't believe so. But, but again, we're not completely sure. So there, there's, the rules are the same as they were before the virus. If you don't want the pregnancy, it's not rocket science to work out how to stop the pregnancy. But you don't have to stop pregnancy because of the virus. Does that does that make sense? Maternity yep. services are, are safe. Obstetric services are safe. We have paths to take you to the obstetric services that will be will be safe. We have we have paused some slightly more specialist services like we've done across the health service. So we've paused some IVF care, for example, around the system. But that was principally about capacity because we didn't want to be overwhelmed. So we re, we moved nurses around, we changed clinics over. As we come out, some of those uh, slightly less acute things will restart. But the, but the advice for couples who wish to conceive is as long as they're in the same household, remember, no mixing households. As long as they're in the same household, the present rules are, forgive the shorthand, knock yourself out. But you, you, are absolutely, you are absolutely allowed to do that. And we will look after you at the beginning and right through to the end. Great, thanks. Nicoletta. Right. I have a, another question here, which is in relation to PrEP. Scotland, as we know, is leading the world in PrEP availability. But now um, we need better flexibility to reduce footfall into clinics. Do they, so the question is directly to yourself. Would you support our move to self sampling for STIs and particularly help change the guidance that PrEP can only be obtained directly from a sexual health clinic. Better access by community pharmacy and GPs who are willing while specialist clinics focus on uh, oversight of systems. So my, my, answer, my answer is a little generic rather than specific. So my, my advice generally is to involve people patients, clients in their own care as much as you possibly can while still keeping the system safe. Particularly if those patients, like they conventionally are in your community, very, very informed. So I am a big believer in, in giving as much of that control out to patients and families as you possibly can. From, from diabetes through to HIV care through to every, every other disease you can think of. The balance to that is you have to make sure that's done in an equitable way because some some communities are more vulnerable than others, don't don't have access, don't have health literacy, don't don't understand what that is to do. So in a balanced service, I, I, I am all for giving that away. Now, the specifics of what this question means, I would have to take advice from a non-oral surgeon and go to somebody with HIV expertise and patient groups to work out what the balance of that might be for your particular set of challenges. But in it in the main, I, I think I think give that power away as much as as much as you possibly can. I think people understand their bodies and their disease better than I ever can. Great. I think one of the things we've seen recently is that um, because we've we want people not to go into clinics for something like PrEP. Um, to prevent HIV is still that sort of wariness about when this all is over, do we really want people to be that, that high level of footfall into clinics 
um, straight away because people will have waited to get their yeah. HIV tests or STI tests. And so I there's going to be a right. high. I think, I think we will want to. And some of what pandemics are not good. I should preface it with that. Pandemics are not a good thing. However, there will be some good perhaps to come out of the pandemic. And one of the things I think we will do more of is uh, video conferencing appointments, more telephone triage, NHS near me, which is Scotland's version of the video conferencing is now in every GP practice in the country. We went from 300 a week to four and a half thousand a day within six weeks. So I, I don't think we'll take them back out of the GP practices. I think we'll keep them in. And secondary care hospitals are beginning to use them more and more as well. So I think you're right. I think there will be a gradual return to a new normal, not, not the same normal we've had. And for a while, whatever we start, it's not rocket science to understand that whatever we do, physical distancing is going to have to be part of that new plan. So places that don't need people to go, if there is another way of doing that, we will be telling them to do that. So the next question that we um, we had, you mentioned the research trials that are ongoing. Um, so the next question we had was around those and whether you believe that people with autoimmune conditions such as HIV should be included in vaccine trials for COVID-19 to make sure they work for us. So the, the traditional way of, of approaching new medicines, vaccines, new, new care, is of course, uh, and your community will understand that, is, is to start with the average Joe or Jenny and, and make sure it's make sure it works in a healthy, non-disease community. You can understand why you do that, a kind of blank slate group, often students actually in, in clinical trials, uh, and, and then move from there to slightly more specialised groups. So if the vaccine works in the 26-year-old dental student or medical student who runs every day does the vaccine work in the over 79 year olds who are housebound who have copd and and those are those are the two extremes and in the middle layer we'll, we will have to work out what that what that means so can you give it to patients with mnd can can you give it to patients with epilepsy and and can you give it to autoimmune disorder patients and i i think the vaccine trials will move in gradually into those settings. There are 119 vaccine trials around the world today, probably probably more today than there were yesterday, but yesterday it was 119 on a big Excel spreadsheet. And 118 of them are only in phase one trials. Phase one trials, animals, experiments, by looking in the lab. One is at phase two trials and will probably fail because that's usually what happens. It, it might be lucky, but it usually fails in phase two trials. And then, but one of those 119 might might get us somewhere, or it might be number 35 and number 64 in some form from Amsterdam and New York that come together and we get, we get something. So, so the scientists are working at a pace I've I've never known and in a global network I've never seen before, because seven billion people need this vaccine. This, this vaccine is not for 30,000 people. This is the, the world will need this vaccine unless something completely dramatic happens and the virus disappears for some inexplicable reason, like in War of the Worlds, but that doesn't really seem very likely. So, so until then, that that's where we're putting our that's where we're putting our poker chips. Great, thanks. I just wanted to give a shout out to Gary, who's watching all the way from Shield Island um, on our live stream, um, and Nick Letter's got the next question. I don't know where Shield Island. Where is Shield Island? In Argyll and Butte, I believe. Oh, it's off the Gary, I'm sure. We'll I yeah, really I'm sure Gary will comment. It's outrageous. <laughs> the national clinical director doesn't know where that is. It's absolutely <laughs> outrageous. My my next question, straightforward to the point: When is it safe to have sex again? It has never been unsafe. But COVID. Well, that, let me correct. Let me correct that sentence, perhaps, to make it slightly clearer. It is no no less safe now than it was, unless you're mixing households. So I'm afraid. Whether you like it or not, it's within your same within your household. Is we could get in dodgy territory with Mrs. Leach downstairs listening very quickly if I'm not careful here. But the COVID nineteen does not make it unsafe. That's my point. So symptomatic people, of course, should be self isolating and should be looking after themselves and getting well. That's the same for flu or a heavy cold or anything else. But there is nothing specific about this virus that makes sex unsafe. It unless you are mixing the households. And that's what we've had to do for public health reasons rather than for 
individual health reasons to try and get the curve of the virus down across the whole country. So we've had Gary has confirmed that Shield Island is just south of Oban and he says hi to everyone um, <laughs> there for you. So the next question um, is how can people living with HIV access COVID-19 testing if they need it? So the same way as the rest of the population. And, and we talked a little bit at the beginning about testing. Testing presently, and this will change, so people will have to watch the guidance as it changes and it will get particularly complicated as we come out of the countermeasures because we'll have to find every case. We'll be trying to, at that point, find every new case. Just now, the community transmission is at such a level where finding every case is, is no, no use to us. It's too much. So just now, if you are a key worker or living with a key worker who anybody in that household has had symptoms, you can get tested. You can do that in two ways, either through the employer, health and social care particularly, through the social care employer or through the health board. If you're not health and social care in your supermarket or armed forces or somewhere else, the fire service, the police, you can do it through the government, the UK government's website, which is which is signposted from the Scottish government website. And you can do that in one of the drive-through centres, of which we now have five around the country. And we're going to get pop-up versions of them quite soon, which will cover slightly more difficult to reach areas, Dumfries, the borders, other other parts of the country. And they, they have capacity. I, I haven't looked this afternoon, but they had capacity this morning. You have to meet criteria. So we don't have capacity or the science really to do the whole population. So you have to answer questions about what you do for a living and are you a key worker and all of that. The other groups that get it are those who are going into hospital or over 70 just now, but the health board will deal with that. And of course, those who are receiving care for COVID. And that's about having the symptoms not improving and phoning 111, getting directed to one of the hubs. And then those hubs would then organise testing for you. That's the present version. So that will change over time and people will have to, people have to pay attention to what that testing is. But there's no reason to treat the HIV community any differently from the rest of society. Okay, Nicoletta. Which leads me really well into my next question uh, from someone who says, uh, I'm worried about the stigma relating to HIV when accessing support, treatment or advice about COVID-19 in the NHS. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, it, it, that, that stigma should be, this is a horrible answer, no worse or better than coming to get your eyes tested or coming to see me to have your wisdom teeth removed or your tongue cancer removed. I, I understand the nature of HIV and this long, long disease and its and its long history in the communities that it has ravaged over the years. So the the same rules apply. It it you are in charge. You I, I, I am not in charge. You you are in charge of, of what you disclose to employers, of what you disclose during your care, and you should be treated with dignity and respect throughout all of those processes. Not only about your HIV status but about everything else, about your personal preferences, about your family, about everything that you bring to that conversation. You should, of course, on the in the balance of that, understand that healthcare workers are also dealing with a new disease. They are, they are dealing with something that's four months old, and we won't have all the answers because we can't have all the answers. So people are finding that quite difficult. They're going to the GP and expecting the solution. And healthcare isn't always binary, I'm afraid. So you, you, you should absolutely call out any prejudice, any sense that you're being treated differently from the rest of the community, because you should not be. COVID-19 is not any different for this community than other communities, unless you're immunosuppressed. If you're immunosuppressed and you have reason for that immunosuppression, of, of course you should. Of course you should tell us. It will help us treat you. But if you are if you're living with a CD4 count that's high and you have no immunosuppression, you're you're no different from from everybody else. But of course, any any immunocompromised condition, bone marrow, severe AIDS, anything would 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 want us to to step in and do something different. 
And you, you mentioned, you know, the stigma around HIV and obviously in, in the past, Jason, you were a, a dentist. Um, so it would be remiss of me not to ask a question around dentistry and HIV because that is, we we as an organisation hear from people living with HIV all the time about stigma that is experienced in, in dental surgeries across the country. Um, for example, being left to the last appointment of the day or coming in for your appointment at 12 o'clock in the afternoon and being kept until the last appointment of the day because you've ticked that box. Is there anything that we can do in partnership with the Scottish Government to try and tackle that stigma that's still that, so prevalent? Isn't that amazing that even, even pieces of the healthcare system find it so difficult to, to, to move on with the science? It's a, it's a horrible case study in what that... When, I, 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 I have some... I was going to say sympathy. That's not the right word. I have some understanding of why it still exists because I remember the 90s and I remember being forced to wear the full PPE with the visors, with the full thing, because we, we had no idea what this virus was. We didn't know what it was doing and who it was doing it to. And I'm 51. So there will be a generation of dentists and surgeons who lived through that, that version of the world. Now, I have understood. I've followed the science. I've I've been a surgeon for some of those years. I'm now a faceless bureaucrat and don't, don't have to dress up in PPE anymore except for media visits. But the 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 dental community hasn't hasn't caught up with that as well as it could have. And I, I think it's worthy of a conversation with the chief dental officer who's a lovely chap uh, who was the head of dentistry in Fourth Valley for many years. He's a public health dentist and and understands it perfectly. And I think it probably would be appropriate for with the professional organizations maybe the bda the the chief dental officer and i to 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 do something along with organizations who understand the disease and and dentists who live with the disease of course, mm, of course yeah. this, this this disease is no respecter of what you do for a living so it it's uh, it, it it would be it would be interesting to find those who have had to live with it or family members who have lived with it those who have who have treated patients and families perfectly safely for years, etc. I think there'd be ways to do that, Nathan. I think it's a good idea. Great. Um, well, I'll follow that up with you afterwards. But the next question we had was around um, shielding and access to treatment. So we've um, this specific question says, "I'm shielding and can't access home care deliveries. How can I get my HIV treatment from my clinic?" Yeah. So shielded people get special treatment. So the only good thing about being shielded is they should be able to access food and medicines and everything else they need. So that that if that is not happening, then there is a number and contact details on the shielding letter. And if that doesn't work, they should contact me and I will put them in touch with the people who can sort that out for them. It's not always quite as straightforward as I make it sound because some people are in Elgin and some people are in Partick, some people are in Shiel. So, so it's a little bit difficult depending on the logistics of where we are, but shielded people uh, sh should be getting both medical supplies, in inverted commas, but also they should have the opportunity for food parcels if they, if they don't have friends and neighbours and family to be able to do that for them. Fr <coughs> Forgive me. Family, friends and neighbours should be your first port of call, actually, because it's easier. You can communicate them more regularly the GPs will give them the prescriptions. All of that is working pretty well. If that's not available, then we have services in place to supply that to the shielded group. Remember, back to the beginning, only 160,000 people, special group. The next group down, 1.6 million people who are in the high-risk group, they have a phone number they can phone, which is 0800 treble one 4000. I don't have it right in front of me. I shouldn't say it out loud unless I'm sure. There is a, there is a, there is a hotline number that that group can phone to get some priority supermarket bookings, some mental health help, some some other some other things in there. But that's for the that's for the one level down from the shielded group. And and just a, a note for anyone that's watching, if you are having a, a difficulty accessing treatment or you you're too wary to go to the clinic, organisations such as HV Scotland, Waverley Care, and the Terence Higgins Trust have all got uh, mechanisms in place to to use volunteers to get that treatment to people that need it if it's not within that shielded group or the extra support. That's great. Um, so that, that speaks to that speaks to the importance of, of organizations in, in supporting. I had a 
a conversation last week with the MND Society and, and Dory Weir's group and, and the, the amount of voluntary work that they have managed to put in place at real pace to help the community has been, has been absolutely terrific. Yeah, within the first week of you know the the coronavirus outbreak, HIV Scotland I think provided something like fifteen hours of direct uh, telephone support and advice to people living with HIV right. who phoned just not knowing what to what yeah. to deal with. So yeah. I think there's lots you're, of organisation. You're, you're better at that than us, Nic Nicoletta. You've got a question. Yeah, my next question is about how can I keep positive mental health during the lockdown. Yeah, isn't that tricky? That's that's a whole population question. There, there's some really good resource. So there's some really good stuff on nhsinform.scot. There's some really good stuff actually, interestingly, on the World Health Organization's website. They've got some they've got some checklists for mental health. They've got some interesting advice. And then there's there's what you should do as an individual. And my my, my instinct is that should be the same as you do normally. That so for me. That's eating well, sleeping well, exercising, and trying to find some time with friends and family, things that re-energize you. So I am, if I'm honest, struggling for time. So I'm struggling to find time to read or watch movies. The nature of this job is a little bit insane, and I'm willing to pay that price for a, for a few weeks. But I am taking some downtime. I do have family and friends who stay close to me and keep my feet firmly on the ground, make sure I don't get too uh, up. up excited about stuff but I also I also think it's before COVID I was spending quite a lot of time talking to populations about sleep being the big, big, big public health challenge of our time and and people underestimate its importance decent nutrition and the exercise allowance in the COVID guidelines is not coincidental we put it there because we we genuinely believe that exercise at, at all times is crucial but particularly at times when mental health might be a big challenge. Those with mental illness, those services are open. And it's really important that people realize that we haven't shut down the mental health services. So what we're talking about in the main there is the vast majority of the population who are managing, who need some help because they're lonely or locked in and, and things feel weird. Those with intractable mental illness, that service still exists. So community nurses are still available psychiatrists are still available and people should not be scared to access those services. They may look a little bit different. We may have relocated them because of COVID cases, but they are still there. Great. Thing. We've got a question from Will on Facebook. Um, why did the Scottish government recommend a face covering in enclosed spaces when the UK government hasn't as yet? It's, it's a good question, Will, and I've answered it all day. So I've I've got it I've got it nailed down. Two two things happened. So what the first thing that happened was the science is developing all the time, and we're beginning to see what we believe to be pre-symptomatic spread, pre-symptomatic spread. So m most people when they get symptoms, a little bit mild at the beginning. It's quite a slow disease. It doesn't happen very suddenly. And they often, self-diagnosis is, is a poor science, so they often don't know they've got symptoms. So it would appear that there are some pre-symptomatic people spreading. And they have to work quite hard with that because the virus has to be shed and then sprayed onto somebody uh, who, who might be close or far away from you. So that's the first thing that happened. We, we, the science is suggesting there may be some pre-symptomatic spread. The second thing that happened is people are wearing them. So as you walk around, you'll see more people wearing facial coverings. So we thought it wise to put something out that put face coverings into perspective, that said, these are what they aren't, and this is what they are. And if you're going to use one, these are the occasions where they would be mildly helpful, and these are the occasions where they're no use whatsoever. But if you're going to, this is what you should do. With them. You should wash them. You should be careful of taking them on and off and washing your hands. You shouldn't wear medical grade masks. You should wear cotton face coverings to cover your face, to cover your mouth and nose. I mean, I, I saw people walking around with them outside, nowhere near anybody. I saw people covering just their mouth, not their nose, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I also see people in supermarkets with gloves and masks on, rummaging around in the apples and then touching their face. And so, so we just we wanted to try and get the right public health advice out. It, it is also in the in the perspective of allowing us to reinforce 
the real strong evidence is physical distancing and hand washing. We know for sure that hand washing gets rid of the virus. We know for sure that you have to be closer than two meters for the virus to reach you. What, we, what we're a little bit vaguer about is whether the cloth coverings do too much, but we know, we know they do a little. That, that's why we did it. The UK government, that's a good question. They, they have kind of the same advisors as us. So we work together as four countries, the scientists, the, the clinicians, we work together. But the decision makers are different. So, so I, I don't make the decisions. I, I provide the best authentic and open advice I can to those decision makers. That's my job. And then the decision makers make those choices. Great, thank you. The next question we've got is around um, employment. So this question came up a lot um, during the start of the pandemic when people were maybe um, more at risk of coronavirus and needing to withdraw from employment or work from home. Yep. Um, but now we've got people that might be starting to worry about when businesses start to open again, if and how they could disclose their HIV status if they are in those high risk groups and potentially don't want to disclose their status because of that stigma we talked about earlier. Yeah. Do we have any advice on how to disclose someone's status or get round that so they don't have to disclose their status? Yeah. But so I, still... I think the, I think if 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 an HIV positive individual is well. Uh, and and CD4 count high, not all, not immunosuppressed, and and controlling everything very well, then I think they can go back to work along with everybody else in the population, uh, as long as everybody is following the guidelines that we're going to set. We're not. It's not going to be Tuesday night. Everybody goes back to work. There's going to be. In fact, after you, I'm on a call with the STUC about what workplaces in the future might need to look like for a while. And they will have to be physically distanced. Outdoor work will go back before indoor work. Everybody will have to have hand washing and alcohol gel. You, so, you, I mean, the population could kind of write these guidelines already. So if you are well, I think probably it will, will be more specific when we come out the other end. But I, I think you're like the rest of the population and your disclosure is a matter for you. If, if, if you're worried about it and you want them to go beyond what they're doing for the rest of the population, then you're going to have to discuss that with your clinical team or occupational health inside your employer. If you are, forgive the shorthand, just for speed, if you are sick, then you, you shouldn't be going back to work because you will be at risk. And that will need a conversation with your clinical team that, that wouldn't be that difficult, actually, because if you are sick, you are a higher risk and you shouldn't be going to work. Then the disclosure, I think, is a discussion between your clinical team, your GP or your, your hospital team, and you and your employer. The protections in place now, I understand the stigma, but there are pretty good protections in place now against employers making, making any very much of a meal of that. I'm sure there are examples where that still is handled badly. I'm, I'm certain. But but the protections in place for, for your community are, are pretty strong from what I from what I understand. There are a particularly high number of employment uh, cases coming through, certainly from HV Scotland's point of view, and I'd just again say for anyone that's that's watching, if there are employment issues, do come forward because it's only when we we know about them that we can help help people and, and deal with them. And I I don't I don't mean to underestimate that in in any way. So so if we can if we can help in the government as well resolve some of that, then of of course we would want to do that. And that maybe the maybe the pandemic gives us an opportunity to to think about some of that a little bit. Oh. Great. Nicoletta, you have a question that leads leads on quite nicely from that. Yes. Is, uh, what advice would you give someone with HIV who has a low CD4 count when restrictions are being lifted again? So it kind of follows from what... Yeah, so I think, I think that has to be a conversation with the, with the clinical team caring for that individual and them and their family. So that that it, it's not binary again. It's not going to be all in, all out. It's going to have to be a conversation about immunity and what that will mean. The, the challenge here, of course, is, I, I repeat myself, the virus is only four months old. So we're not absolutely certain what it does. We're not even certain what it does in July, never mind what it does for each individual person in July. So we don't know, for instance, if this virus is seasonal. Coronaviruses often are. 
So we don't know if it might disappear from here and reappear in Australia in August. We, we, we simply do not know. But I, I think anybody with a CD4 count that makes them susceptible to viral infection, it's not rocket science to suggest they may have to be protected for some time further. Those, those with a normal CD4 count, like the rest of us, I, I think can go about their business as usual once, once, we start to, once we start to remove those measures. There's one, one question that, that's come through on YouTube was around, the, we, we talked about HIV treatment being used as, as a treatment for, for coronavirus. Um, there is a study in Spain at the moment that's, that's looking at how tenofovir or, or yep. the, the drug we use for PrEP um, in Scotland being used as rather than a treatment as a protection um, for coronavirus. And as yet, we've not seen any any real efficacy in that. Would, would you support that sort of view? Yeah, so there's no, there's no evidence of any of the PrEP drugs or the antivirals or anything else helping. In fact, the first antiviral study that got anywhere has had to be stopped because it was making people worse. So the science is so young that that e e even the, f the first few trials, and this is what always happens in clinical medicine. We, you, you try stuff and then you think, oh, let's move, up, let's move over here again. We're just doing it much more visibly because it's in the public eye because it's the only story in the news all over the world. But there is nothing yet. I, I'm hopeful, but not because I have any actual science in it. I'm hopeful that because of the nature of what we're doing all over the world, something will come. We, we, will, we will find either an old drug or a new drug or an existing antiviral or something that might, might slow progression. That, that seems to me to be the, the most likely thing to find first rather than a prevention drug or a vaccine. I'm, I'm hopeful that we might find something that slows it down in some way, particularly in the vulnerable, who, who proceed quite rapidly to pneumonia and then that's what kills them. So in that bit, it would be good to find a treatment drug that would at least give the body more time. Because all we're doing in intensive care just now is supporting the body to recover. We're not, we're not treating the patients in any way. We're just supporting their own bodies to recover. So if we could do something in there that would help them to even just to buy time for their own immunity to, to, to fix it, then that seems to me to be the most likely area of early science. Then there might be preventive stuff to stop people getting it. And then finally, there will be vaccine to stop everybody getting it. All right, so Nicoletta's got one of our final questions. Um, Nicoletta. Yes. Um, should Health Force continue to show a commitment to patient involvement, especially for people living with HIV? through appropriate funding of local groups to ensure they're not out of pocket? So point number one, for sure. So I am, my proper job is, is the quality of the health and social care delivery system and person-centered care is my, I've got a big department of person-centered care. We're the people who did the open visiting. We're the people who do what matters to you. We're the people who fund and pay for care opinion the open source website to allow patients and families to respond in real time to their care. I, I could not be a bigger champion of, of patient and family involvement, both in their individual care, but also in improving everything that we do. In resource terms, that, that's tricky because we need the third sector to help us with that. And we my, my unit uh, helps fund the Alliance who do that at a, at a Scottish level and then individual grants to smaller organizations, and I am all for that. But my, my challenge, of course, is pr over promising and under delivering for, for every organization that we speak to. But in principle, I, I think the third sector organizations are absolutely crucial in that delivery both of care, but also in advice and, and support for whichever, whichever community that happens to be. So you could not have a bigger advocate for, for person-centered care. Great. Well, that was um, the last question. There was one more question that we c came in through Facebook, although I'm not sure this will be one for, for you to answer, Jason, but I'm happy to, to answer it. Will um, trans men on PrEP still have access to their prescriptions and their care and monitoring, specifically because the event-based dosing, which reduces the amount of PrEP someone would need, 
is isn't recommended for them. And um, we would just say absolutely yes. We've been working as HIV Scotland with um, clinicians across across the country to make sure that people who need to have access to their prescri prescriptions and the monitoring can still absolutely get that. And if there are any problems, um, we have there's been a couple of people that have fallen through the cracks. Um, we've been able to sort them out access to to prep and their testing and, and treatment. So so do just get in touch with us if there's any problems with that. So I just COVID want to... shouldn't, my, my only addition would be COVID shouldn't have made any difference to that routine care. What COVID has done, of course, for hopefully just a few weeks, is forced us to redesign some journeys, some pathways, and some particularly elective care. So waiting for hips and knees and cataracts has now become unfortunately longer. But routine care for chronic disease, for lack of a better description, should not have changed other than the logistics of it might have changed a little, but the fact of it shouldn't have changed. Yep, absolutely. Um, well, that's just got to the last of our questions, not only from the pre-submitted ones, but also all the ones that have been submitted throughout the live stream. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Jason, for taking up some time in your very busy schedule to come. You're very welcome. It was fun. People on, on this live stream. And then next week, we do have Professor Sharon Lewin, all the way from Australia, who is a world-renowned uh, HIV cure researcher, who will be here on Wednesday at 930 so we can chat about HIV cure, and I'm, I'm sure she'll have some information um, about research that's happening around the uh, COVID-19 cure or vaccine as well. So tune in and then. But from all of us here at HIV Scotland, thank you and goodbye.